This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. In these podcasts, we uncover one chapter after another from the life of the Prophet wasallam in an attempt to learn about him, to love him, and to better ourselves through his example. Immersion, mentorship, companionship, and tarbiyah. These are just a few of the things we offer alongside knowledge of the prophetic biography at the Sirah Intensive. Two weeks dedicated to the study of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and his noble characteristics. So this winter, join me in Dallas, Texas, alongside your classmates from all over the world to learn the story of the life of the best of humanity, the ultimate mercy to mankind, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Inshallah continuing with our series on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as siratul nabawiyya, the prophetic biography. We were last uh, talking about the Battle of Uhud. Actually, we've been talking about the Battle of Uhud for quite some time now, alhamdulillah, going into a lot of detail and understanding all the depth and all, uh, trying to uncover all the lessons and the wisdom that we can find uh, from this monumental major event from the life of the Prophet wasallam. In the previous session, we talked about the conclusion of the battle, how the battle basically culminated, and the dua the Prophet ﷺ gathered the Sahaba, lined them up, and made a dua at the conclusion of the battle. And we went through that dua in a lot of detail. What I wanted to talk about next was something very, um, very difficult to talk about, just emotionally. It's something that is very uh, touching and also very sensitive of an issue. Um, that the Prophet of Allah now had to turn his attention to serving the damage and to basically start to look for those who had fallen in the battlefield and to start recovering their bodies to find the injured and the wounded and particularly those who were shaheed, those who had been martyred in the battle. The narrations mention uh, one of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum um, by the name of... Um, Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdurrahman ibn Abi Sa'asa'a al-Mazini who belonged to the tribe of Banu Najjar. This was one of the Medinan tribes, the Ansari tribes. He says that after the, the fighting had concluded, the Prophet of Allah وسلم, said, when inquiring about people, he specifically didn't see one person. So he said, Man rajulun yanzuru li ma fa'ala Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah. Who can go and find Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah for me and basically find out what ended up happening with him? Now, why is Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah specifically being sought out by the Prophet ﷺ? Of course, every single human being, every single believer, every single Muslim is very valuable. Every soul is precious. But specifically, what is it that Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah was so high up on the list of the Prophet ﷺ that he's one of the first people the Prophet ﷺ is looking for and inquiring about? So a few things about Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah in case you know you don't recall. Number one, Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah radiallahu ta'ala anhu was, was, was one of the nuqaba. Kana, min, kana ahadun nuqaba. He was one of the 12 community organizers the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had appointed for the city of Medina after the second pledge of allegiance, the second oath of allegiance that the Medina Muslims had given to the Prophet sallallahu back in Mecca in Mina during the days of Hajj before the Prophet sallallahu came to Medina he appointed 12 community leaders to go back and organize the community of Muslims in Medina Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah was one of them and the Prophet sallallahu basically had even even said to them at that time that you are my representation, you are my eyes and ears in the community in Yathrib in Medina. So they were very respected even by the Prophet ﷺ. He had a great amount of respect for them. In fact, after the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina, the first janaza that occurred in Medina was one of the nuqaba by the name of uh, Asad bin Zurara. 
radiallahu anhu. We talked about that. That was the first janaza that was performed in the Medinan community. And when Sa'ad bin Zurara passed away, there was a lot of discussion. And you know, there was, there was some discussion about who will assume his place and his role as a naqib, as the leader of his community. And the Prophet ﷺ at that time had actually said, I personally will take the role of Asad bin Zurara. So these were individuals the Prophet ﷺ respected greatly. And this was a job that he also had a great amount of respect for as well. So Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah is one of the nuqaba, which is a very big deal. Secondly, you might recall, it's actually quite famous and well known that whenever we talk about the Ansar, the generosity of the Ansar, the hospitality of the Ansar, we often give the example of, the, of Abdurrahman bin Auf, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that when he came to Medina, his brother from the Ansar, remember the Prophet ﷺ performed the muakhat, he created the bonds of brotherhood between an Ansari and a Muhajir. A Meccan Muslim, a migrant Muslim, and a local Medinan Muslim. He had joined them as brothers. And we always give the example that when Abdurrahman bin Auf radiallahu anhu came, his Ansari brother said, take half of my wealth, half of my property, half of my home, half of my business, and so on and so forth. Was willing to literally split everything. With Abdurrahman bin Auf radiallahu ta'ala anhu, even though he didn't even know him just a few days prior to this conversation. But this was how seriously they took their Islam and the instruction of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Well, we oftentimes tell that story and we say the Ansari brother of Abdurrahman bin Auf. Who was that Ansari brother? That this remarkable man who had such a great and generous heart. We should know his name. And his name was Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah. Right, so he's somebody that obviously you can tell from his character, he must have been very appreciated and beloved to the Messenger of Allah So the Prophet ﷺ inquires, مَنْ رَجُلٌ يَنْظُرُ لِي مَا فَعَلَ سَعَدُ بْنُ رَبِيْهِ And he doesn't even say, يَنْظُرُ لَنَا Who can go and find out for us what happened with Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah? No, who can go and find out for me? I personally need to know how is Sa'ad. So, أَفِي الْأَحْيَاءِ هُوَ أَمْ فِي الْأَمْوَاتِ is he living or is he amongst the deceased? So one of the individuals from the Ansar, he volunteered himself and he said, Ana ya Rasulullah, I will go and inquire on Messenger of Allah. And there are two narrations. One of the narrations which is mentioned by Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says that the man who went and looked for Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah was Muhammad bin Maslama. Muhammad ibn Maslama. Muhammad ibn Maslama was the same individual who was involved in the situation of Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf, for reference. And however, um, Abu Umar, in his Isti'ab, another early classical work of the seerah, he actually says that the one who went and looked for Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah was Ubay ibn Ka'b radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Um, and similarly, uh, Alama Suhaili says the same thing in al Radul Anf, that it was uh, Ubay ibn Ka'b. However, Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala says, Wallahu a'lam, both narrations seem to be valid. So it could be that both individuals went off to go look for Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah. Maybe that's the reconciliation between it. However, regardless of that fact, Whoever it was, he says that Amar inna Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam amarani an anzura fil ahyai anta. So he says, I came across. فوجده جريحا في القتلة. I found Saad ibn Rabi'ah. He was fatally wounded and injured. His body was lying amongst a pile of dead bodies. He was lying amongst a pile of dead bodies of Muslims, but he himself was not deceased yet. But he had suffered a very serious fatal wound, وَبِهِ رَمَقٌ And there was a spear that was sticking out of him. And so I realized, seeing the seriousness of his injuries, that it doesn't look like there's a good chance that he'll survive. However, I sat down, I kneeled down next to him, and I said to him, إِنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ أَمَرَنِي أَنْ أَنْذُرَ فِي الْأَحْيَاءِ أَنْتَ فِي الْأَمْوَاتِ the Messenger of God, peace and blessings be upon him. The Prophet ﷺ himself has instructed me, has commanded me to look for you, whether you are amongst the living or amongst the dead. فَقَالَ أَنَا فِي الْأَمْوَاتِ He says, I am practically amongst the dead. I don't think I'm going to make it. 
So he says, but in these last few moments and breaths that I have, I need you to take care of something for me. Now, you can imagine what somebody would do in that scenario, in that situation. Sa'ad ibn Rabi'a radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says, فَأَبْلِغْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ عَنِّي السَّلَامِ Please deliver my salam to the Messenger of God صلى الله عليه وسلم. وَقُلْ لَهُ إِنَّ سَعَدَ بْنَ رَبِيعَ يَقُولُ لَكَ And please say to him, the Sa'ad ibn Rabi'a says to you, O Messenger of Allah, جَزَاكَ اللَّهُ عَنَّا خَيْرَ مَا جَزَى نَبِيًا عَنْ أُمَّتِهِ That may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you on our behalf better than any reward Allah has ever given to any Prophet on behalf of his Ummah and his followers. وَأَبْلِغْ قَوْمَكَ عَنِّي السَّلَامِ And ask the Prophet ﷺ to deliver my salams to the rest of my people, the Ummah. وَقُلْ لَهُمْ And he says, and then address the rest of the companions, the Muslims, address them on my behalf. And say to them, إِنَّ سَعَدَ بْنَ رَبِيعَ يَقُولُ لَكُمْ سَعَدَ بْنُ رَبِيعَ has a message for all of you. إِنَّهُ لَا عُذْرَ لَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ إِنْ خُلِصَ إِلَى نَبِيِّكُمْ وَمِنْكُمْ عَيْنٌ تَطْرِفْ He says that you will have no excuse before God if people are able to get to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and amongst you there is still an eye that blinks. He says, ثُمَّ لَمْ أَبْرَى حَتَّى مَاتَى And he says, I was still kneeling down next to him, holding his hand. That he gasped and he breathed his last. فَجِئْتُ النَّبِيَّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ فَأَخْبَرْتُهُ خَبْرَهُ So I came to the Prophet of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم and I told the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and I communicated and relayed the message that he had entrusted me with. This was the love and the respect and the reverence that the Sahaba had for the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. Right? And even though I had intended to go through quite a bit, um, there's a lot we have to talk about here in terms of the, the, the body of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu and some of the important considerations, um, the overall issue of you know, the Prophet وسلم, performing the janazah or not of the shuhada of Uhud and exactly some of the discussion and the issues there. Um, and I know that, you know, uh, alhamdulillah, yesterday we had um, some of our very respected, you know, scholars and community leaders, you know, addressing basically the events of uh, a couple of days ago, the shooting in Garland and things like that. And so, alhamdulillah, they probably did a much better job than I would be able to uh, do. However, in light of this, because... I feel it necessary to mention this and I know that this gets recorded and sometimes people are listening to it later so if somebody's listening quite later I apologize if it feels kind of misplaced but we recently um, when I'm delivering this session we had the incident in Dallas, Texas here where um, some individuals unfortunately uh, in poor choice and poor taste and actually quite frankly out of hatred and, and ignorance uh, put together a, a little event, uh, calling it an event is even giving it too much credit, uh, got together to try to offend Muslims by trying to um, mock the Prophet wasallam. And again, very unfortunately, um, a couple of misguided individuals took it upon themselves to address that situation by taking you know, violent action and aggressive action, uh, it ended in the injury of a security guard and the, uh, the shooting of those two individuals. Um, and in the aftermath of that, it renewed the entire conversation that we had a few months ago prior to that because of the incident in France, and prior to that because of another incident and another incident and so on and so forth. Um, and the reason why I feel like Overall, as a general scenario, this needs to be addressed and needs to be mentioned here, even though I've talked about it before. is because when you read this narration, and you read incidents like this, this has fueled a lot of the fervor. These types of narrations and incidents have fueled a lot of the fervor, a lot of the energy, if you will, 
when it comes to quote unquote defending the honor of the Prophet ﷺ. Right? That you have Sahaba here giving their lives, pledging their allegiance. Their last words are salams to the Prophet ﷺ. Their last dying, you know, kind of request, their last bequest is to their fellow uh, companions and followers of the Prophet ﷺ that don't let anyone even dare approach the Prophet ﷺ while you have a breath left in your body. That this directly feeds a lot of times into that rhetoric. And I, not, I'm not necessarily speaking about people who have an agenda, but I'm talking about the honest, sincere students of the religion and the life of the Prophet ﷺ, who is sitting at home reading this, listening to this, and is sitting there thinking that if this is how the companions felt about the Prophet ﷺ, doesn't that demand that we actually do something drastic? And somebody could be led down a road of confusion. So it's important for us to be able to answer these questions. Because we don't do ourselves any favors when we just dismiss, no, 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 that's crazy. You can't do that, that's wrong. Well, it is correct to say that it's wrong, but I need an explanation as to why it's wrong. I need someone to explain to me how to contextualize this, how to understand this. And so one of the things that we talk about is that, and that you know, we emphasize, my teachers emphasize to me, I try to emphasize to our students, and you know, my teachers, teachers emphasize to them, and it's a part of our tradition. And this is why the proper study of the religion is so important. From teacher, to, from teacher to student. The passing on of the tradition. And the understanding of the text. The text will be preserved and will continue. But the understanding of that text needs to also be transmitted. And that's, the, the, that's, how, that's what's so profound about the saying of the Prophet ﷺ where he says that knowledge will leave not by the text itself disappearing. We have the text much more preserved today than we have had at any time throughout Islamic history. You could not eradicate, even if you tried to, the Qur'an from this world today. It's just everywhere. It's on every device, it's in every home. So you couldn't. The authentic ahadith, the sunnah, of the Prophet ﷺ is so well documented and preserved and replicated and published. You couldn't if you wanted to, distort it or eradicate it. But the Prophet ﷺ, of course, having that foresight, knowing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that that would be the case, is still saying, knowledge will leave this world. But he explains how knowledge will leave this world, that the text won't disappear. But the people of knowledge will be taken away, and they won't be followed by a similar people of understanding. Ulama. People of knowledge and the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the depth and the understanding of the knowledge. And that should tell you something. That the, there will come a time, and may Allah protect us all, that the text will be there, but there will be no understanding of the text. And that's what we fear. And that's why, we, we're, that's why we're all gathered here. And sitting here and listening. And trying to understand all of us together. Right? So the understanding is very important. So one of the things that we understand is that no singular ayah speaks in isolation or in contradiction to the rest of the Qur'an. And no singular hadith or event from the life of the Prophet ﷺ speaks in isolation or in contrast, right, in contradiction to the rest of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and the sunnah of the Messenger of God. It just doesn't work that way. We've never understood it that way. In fact, something you know, I've mentioned here before, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he says that even when you study specifically, when you study ayat of, uh, of, a, part, of a, tip, a similar topic, like a thematic study of the Qur'an, where you're going to go through and read all the ayat of qital and jihad, of military engagement and warfare, you have to not only know each and every single ayah addressing that topic, but you have to know the sequence in which they were revealed. And you have to be able to study it in light of the sequence in which it was revealed. And then in the sequence in which it's compiled. And then piece all of them together. And then come to a very sophisticated conclusion on the issue and the topic. Right? This is, this is some serious work. And so when we look at the life of the Prophet ﷺ, 
we see that to what extent was retaliation against, you know, disrespect or even offense against the Prophet ﷺ, to what extent was it practiced and was it legislated? And so what we actually find is, and this is part of the methodology of some of the earliest scholars uh, who interpreted the religion, such as Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullahu ta'ala, and others, who basically said that you not only have to look at all the ayat or all the ahadith on a subject, but then you also have to look at how many ayat are saying one thing and how many ayat are saying another thing. How many ahadith are saying one thing and how many ahadith are saying another thing. And that also highlights to you what is the norm and what is the, what is the rule and what is the exception. What is the rule and what is the exception. So when we look in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, everything from forgiving, to ignoring, to responding verbally, to counteracting with ideas and thoughts, that how many examples of that do we have? By the hundreds throughout the life of the Prophet ﷺ, and how many examples do we have of him actually taking some type of serious... You know, military, state-sanctioned action against a problematic individual. Right? And you find one or two examples of that. Amongst hundreds of examples of the complete opposite. And when we make one out of a hundred the rule, thereby calling the other hundred the exception, we make a mockery of our own deen and religion. That is contradictory to every asal, every rule and principle that we have when it comes to the interpretation of the religion and extrapolation of rulings from the religion and the sacred text. So this is very important for us to take into consideration. That this dialogue and this sentiment of the companions was not in contradiction to the prophetic example and precedent in the Qur'anic edict of being forgiving and ignoring and turning the other cheek, so to speak. Right? That this is not in contradiction to that. They're just expressing their own personal sentiments and feelings in a very passionate, in a very emotional, desperate moment of one breathing their last and gasping for breath and departing from this world. That that is the context and that is the understanding. And it's our job and responsibility to understand that, internalize that, and then to be able to communicate it to others as well. What time is Salat al-Isha? 9.45? Excuse me. So we'll go forward um, just to talk about um, the next situation since we do have, alhamdulillah, some time. Um, the next situation that's mentioned here about surveying of the aftermath of the Battle of Uhud is one of the most, um, again, emotionally difficult moments in the life of the Prophet wasallam. And that is the Prophet of Allah wasallam coming across the body of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Now to refresh everyone's memory, and we just talked about it maybe a few sessions back, Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib radiallahu ta'ala anhu is the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu his father's younger brother. Number two, Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu was not a lot older than the Prophet sallallahu so he was that example of being a very young uncle. Right, where there's just a few years of a difference between uncle and nephew. Where the relationship ends up becoming more like brothers than uncle and nephew. That we might be accustomed or used to. Secondly, they actually were brothers. They were what we call radai brothers. They were foster brothers. They were both nursed by the same woman. Uh, and there are actually three notable people who were nursed by the same woman and they were all brothers through rada'a, nursing brothers, foster brothers. The Prophet ﷺ, Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and the third one is Abu Salama radiallahu anhu. 
One of the early converts to Islam, one of the first 40 Muslims, one of the first individuals to migrate to Habasha, Abyssinia. He was also one of the Sahaba who has the honor of having done Hijratain. Both Hijras, he went to Habasha, Abyssinia, and he also went to Al Madinah to Munawwara, where eventually he passed away. Um, and so Abu Salama, radiallahu anhu. So all three of them were basically nursed by the same woman, and that woman was Thuwayba. Um, who is the who was a slave woman who belonged to Abu Lahab? She was eventually freed, uh, and she became a free woman. Some uh, s- historians and scholars of the Sira say that she did end up accepting Islam. Wallahu taala alam sawab. Allah subhanahu wa taala knows best. But inshallah, having that as the only information that we have about her, there's no harm in foul in basically accepting that. So radiallahu taala anha. May Allah be pleased with her. So. Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu is the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu the brother of the Prophet sallallahu somebody who always defended the Prophet sallallahu had his back, somebody the Prophet sallallahu was very emotionally attached to. He came to Islam a little bit later, and the Prophet sallallahu was so overjoyed by his accepting Islam. And it really op- provided the Prophet sallallahu a lot of emotional support, provided him a very um, strong person from his own family from amongst his uncles who basically became one of his supporters and he opened many doors for the community in general and provided kind of some muscle to the community where the community was able to kind of push back with. So that is Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu. A few sessions back we talked about Wahshi being hired, being um, basically b- being hired to assassinate uh, Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu and we talked about the entire incident where he kills Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu now that the battle has ended kharaja rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ibn ishaq says the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa himself personally set out into the battlefield fi ma balaghani yaltamisu hamza ibn abdul muttalib he went around himself personally looking for Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu. That when the battle concluded and everyone started to congregate and he didn't see Hamza's face, the Prophet sallallahu became so worried, he personally went out looking for Hamza radiallahu anhu. فَوَجْدَهُ بِبَطْنِ الْوَادِي He found him in the valley where the, the heat of the battle basically took place. And we talked about that. وَقَدْ بُقِرَ بَطْنُهُ عَنْ كَبَدِهِ His stomach... His belly had been ripped open. His liver had been ripped out. Muthila bihi. He had been mutilated. We talked about this. Fajudi anfuhu wa udunahu. His nose and his uh, ears had been chopped off, had been cut off. Very unfortunately. And when the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Hina ra'a ma ra'a. Ja'far bin Muhammad ibn Ja'far ibn Zubair, one of the, you know, great grand, one of the, the progen, the family members, the descendants of the family of the Prophet ﷺ, from the Ahlul Bayt, the Ahlul Bayt. He narrates this, he says, Hina ra'a ma ra'a, when the Prophet ﷺ saw what he saw, he said, Lawla an tahzana Safiya, that if it wasn't for the grief of my aunt Safiya, the older sister of Hamza, who had raised Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu like one of her own. You know, being an older sister, she had raised him like one of her own children. So he said, لَوْلَا أَن تَحْزَنَ صَفِيَّ If it was not for the grief of my aunt Safiya, وَتَكُونَ سُنَّةً مِّن بَعْدِي And that it would actually become a sunnah after me. Because the Prophet ﷺ understood his position. That everything the Prophet ﷺ does, becomes legislation, becomes the law. It is, becomes precedent. He says, لَتَرَكْتُهُ حِينَ يَكُونَ فِي بُطُونِ السِّبَاعِ وَحَوَاصِلِ الطَّيْرِ I would leave the body of Hamza lying here until the animals and the birds would eat and consume his body. Out of protest to what has been done to the body of Hamza. وَلَئِنْ أَذْهَرَنِيَ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ قُرَيْشِ فِي مَوْطِنٍ مِّنَ الْمَوَاطِنِ لَأُمَثِّلَنَّ بِثَلَاثِينَ رَجُلًا مِّنْهُمْ and he said that if Allah grants me the opportunity, I would do the same thing to 30 individuals from Quraysh. When the Muslims saw the grief of the Prophet ﷺ, 
and this, the, 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 the strong emotions he was experiencing, even some of the Sahaba responded very emotionally by saying, Wallahi, لَإِنْ أَذْفَرَنَ اللَّهُ بِهِمْ يَوْمًا مِنَ الدَّهْرِ لَنُمَثِّلَنَّ بِهِمْ مُثْلَةً لَمْ يُمَثِّلَا أَحَدٌ مِنَ الْعَرَبِ We will do to them what the Arabs have never seen. If Allah ever grants us the opportunity, we will do to the Quraysh what the Arabs have never seen. Because of the pain they have caused the Prophet ﷺ. Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he says, he narrates that it was at this time or due to this incident that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayah from Surah An-Nahl, which is Surah number 15, um, or excuse me, Surah number 16, Ayah number 126 and 127, وَاصْبِرْ وَمَا صَبْرُكَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet ﷺ, that if you retaliate, then retaliate in accordance with what they have done, with what has been done to you. If you choose to retaliate, then retaliate completely in accordance with what has been done to you. But if you choose to be patient, then that is, then it is better. Patience is better for those who have the ability to be patient. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking directly to the Prophet ﷺ, that was speaking collectively, speaking directly, individually, singularly, to the Prophet ﷺ. This is from the Qur'anic nuance here, the grammatical nuance, that way in عَاقَبَتُمْ فَعَاقِبُوا بِمِثْلِ مَا عُوقِبْتُمْ بِهِ وَلَئِن صَبَرْتُمْ فَهُوَ لَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لِلصَّابِرِينَ It is all in the plural. If all of you choose to retaliate, then retaliate in accordance with, what, what, with the aggression that was committed against all of you. But if y'all choose to be patient, then that is better for the people who have the ability to be patient. It was plural. And then Allah speaks in the singular. Switches. Wasbir. Not wasbiru. Wasbir. And in light of this, the mufassirun and the ulama, they say that while Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislated here in this ayah, that if somebody commits something against you, that it would be, that it, it, there's a discussion about exactly what scenario and what and how and who and where and why. But nevertheless, there is some room for a discussion about possible retaliation. And actually, it's not individual retaliation. There's no vigilantism. Islam does not allow that, sanction that. But basically, it's referring to the fact that if there is that a court system in place, then you are fully within your rights to go and demand uh, remuneration, or um, you're, you, you, you are within your rights to basically go and demand um, you know, some type of compensation or action be taken against the person who basically has done this to you. However, the instruction to the Prophet wasallam, even within the legal framework and structure, is, but you have to forgive. Muslims, if somebody commits something against you, you can go to the court, you can go to the police, you can go to the authorities, and you can demand that action be taken against that person. That's justice, that's correct, that's fine. But Muhammad wasallam, wasbir, you have to be patient. You have to be patient. Because you came not only to legislate, but you also came to demonstrate. And to exemplify. So you have to set the bar much, much higher. وَاصْبِرْ وَمَا صَبْرُكَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ And know that your patience is only because Allah asked you to. Know that your patience is only because Allah asked you to. Not because you didn't have the ability to seek, you know, vengeance or, you know, retribution. Not because you didn't have the ability to seek retribution, but because you did it for Allah, because Allah asked you to. Allah told you to. And so at that particular time, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he basically said, I forgive them, and I will not seek this retribution. And he also commanded the Sahaba that no. However, so this is the popular narrative that you'll find in many of the books of Sirah and the books of Tafsir. Ibn Kathir 
rahimallahu ta'ala, being a scholar of the seerah, historian, a muhaddith, a scholar of the tafsir, of the tafsir of the Qur'an. Alright? Ibn Kathir rahimallahu ta'ala, who has every right to basically have his own opinion in this, and ijtihad in this issue, he says that these ayat of Surah Al-Nahal, these are makkiyah. These were revealed in Makkah. Uhud is happening in Medina. Three years, in the third year of the Medinan era, in the Medinan period. فَكَيْفَ يَلْتَئِمُوا هَذَا مَعَ هَذَا وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ He says, I do not see the correlation, the connection. So Ibn Kathir rahmahullah ta'ala basically says, I am skeptical about the validity of the narrations that mention that the Prophet ﷺ had this strong feeling and said that I would mutilate these people. I would seek vengeance against 30 of their people if I had the opportunity. That he says, I am skeptical about the validity of these narrations. And this is a function within Usul Hadith that is basically called Ta'aleel. Ta'aleel. That sometimes there is a strong enough of a more, you can say, scholarly or academic reason to cast doubt that while there might not be something explicitly problematic in the chain of narration, there might not be something explicitly problematic surrounding the narration, but the subject and the tone of the narration itself is something that so drastically contradicts every other instruction in the religion that the scholars validly cast doubt on that particular narration. Right? And Imam Tirmidhi rahimahullah ta'ala is basically the expert of this particular science, and many other scholars, like Imam Bukhari points out, Ta'aleel in certain areas, Imam Dhahabi, Ibn Hajar, Rahimahumullah Ta'ala, Imam Nawawi, and many, many others, have basically also, you know, practiced this discipline. It's very, very difficult. Only the highest caliber and level of not just muhaddith, but also kind of a scholar um, who is a mufassir and also a philosopher of the religion is basically able to come to these types of conclusions. But nevertheless, Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, I find this entire explanation to be deeply problematic. And so he casts doubt on it. He ends with, Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Allah knows best ultimately, but nevertheless, just for one's information, in case if you even come across this conversation, then know that it is not absolutely conclusive, and its authenticity is not completely agreed upon. Alright, so it would be completely valid and fair to not even, you know, to maybe even see a problem with the authenticity and the authority of this particular incident and narration. And he further then mentions a couple of other narrations to um, solidify, bring his point home. He mentions another narration that is narrated by one of the teachers of Imam Bukhari, Humaid, that says, that narrates from Al-Hasan al-Basri rahmallahu ta'ala from Samura, that مَا قَامَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ فِي مَقَامٍ قَدْتُ فَفَارَقَهُ حَتَّى يَأْمُرَ بِالصَّدَقَةِ وَيَنْهَا عَنِ الْمُثْلَةِ مَا قَامَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَمَ فِي مَقَامٍ قَدْتُ The Prophet ﷺ never set camp at a place, which basically means the Prophet ﷺ never went on a military campaign, on an expedition, he never went for a battle, that prior to leaving the place of the battle, the battlefield, except that the Prophet ﷺ would command all the Sahaba to give charity, to give sadaqah, to serve as an expiation, a removal, a washing away of any sins, that might have been committed in the course of the battle, so he would command them to give sadaqah as washing away of the sins. And number two, وَيَنْهَا عَنِ muthla. And the Prophet ﷺ always, in every single battle, forbade the sahaba from ever engaging in mutilating of anybodies. Haram, la yajus. So this also demonstrates the fact that it does not seem appropriate that that would be something said by the Prophet of Allah ﷺ. Alright? Nevertheless, of course, when the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa saw the body of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the narration, Ibn Hisham mentions this, um, very, very powerful. He says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala Hamza. He stood over the body of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu for quite some time. Just looking at him, just taking it in. It was very difficult. And he said, لَنْ أُصَابَ مِمِثْلِكَ أَبَدًا لَنْ أُصَابَ بِمِثْلِكَ أَبَدًا 
I, have, I will never ever again suffer a loss like the loss of you, O Hamza. This is the greatest loss of my life. And he says, مَا وَقَفْتُ مَوْقِفًا قَدْتُ أَغْيَضُ إِلَيَّ مِنْ هَذَا That this is the most tragic moment of my life. To see you here like this. To see what they've done with you and to you. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, جَاءَنِي جِبْرِيل That just now, Jibreel alayhi salam came to me. فَأَخْبَرَنِي And he informed me. أَنَّ حَمْزَةَ مَكْتُوبٌ فِي أَهْلِ السَّمَاوَاتِ السَّبْعِ That Hamza's name has been written in the seven heavens. And it is written there, حَمْزَةُ بْنُ عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبْ أَسَدُ اللَّهِ وَأَسُدُ رَسُولِهِ That Hamza, the son of Abdul Muttalib, is the lion of Allah and the lion of his messenger. And <clears throat> at this particular time, the Prophet ﷺ also had to deal with the situation of Safiya radiallahu ta'ala anha, the aunt of the Prophet ﷺ, the older sister of Hamza, who was like a mother to Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anha, and even to the Prophet ﷺ. That the Prophet ﷺ, he told um, Zubair radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Zubair ibn al-Awwam, Radiallahu anhu, who was the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he told Zubair radiallahu taala anhu, and Zubair was the son of Safiya, was the son of Safiya. He was a cousin of the Prophet because he was the son of Safiya. The Prophet sallallahu specifically told Zubair radiallahu taala anhu that I want you to keep your mother Safiya away from here. I want you want you to keep your mother Safiya away from here. I don't want her. To see Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu, um, her brother Hamza, in this particular condition. So, after a while, after they're basically surveying the situation, and the Sahaba gathered kind of around the Prophet, وسلم, kind of watching him mourn Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu, they saw in the distance that a woman was basically walking towards them. أقبلت امرأة تسعى. She was walking very quickly towards them. So some of them started to say, المرأة المرأة. There's a woman coming. There's a sister coming. Zubair رضي الله تعالى عنه says, I recognize from a distance أنها أمي صفية. That this is my mother صفية. فخرجت أسعى إليها. So I went out rushing towards her. فأدركتها قبل أن تنتهي إلى القتلة. And I got to her before she got to حمزة رضي الله عنه. So when I got to her, فَلَدَمَتْ فِي صَدْرِي She shoved me in my chest. She's the mother. She shoved me in my chest. وَكَانَتْ إِمْرَأَةٌ جَلْدَ وَكَانَتْ إِمْرَأَةٌ جَلْدَ She was a very strong woman. Zubair رضي الله was a warrior. He says, my mother, she was very, very elderly at this time, 70, 80 years old, at the very least. So she was a, still a strong woman. And she shoved me and she said, إِلَيْكَ لَا أَرْضَى لَكَ Get out of my way. Who do you think you are? Right? Because it's her son. And so, Zubair radiallahu ta'ala anhu, at that time, he informs her, he says that, أَلْقَهَا So, he says that the Prophet sallallahu told me, يأمر, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّ الرَّسُولَ يَا أُمَّةَ إِنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ وسلم يَأْمُرُكِ أَن تَرْجِعِي That the Messenger of God tells you to go back. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, لَا تَرَى مَا بِأَخِيهَا I don't want her to see what happened to her brother. She said, وَلِمَا Why? Right, because even, now she's not being disrespectful or disobedient to the Messenger of Allah. She's talking to her son about her nephew. Right, so you have to understand relationships. Right, she's a Qurayshi woman. Very strong, very proud. She says, Lima, why? وَقَدْ بَلَغَنِي أَنَّهُ مُثِّلَ بِأَخِي She goes, don't worry. I know, people have told me they have mutilated my brother's body. وَذَلِكَ فِي اللَّهِ And that is for the sake of Allah. He did it for Allah. And I will see it for Allah. And I will bear it for Allah. So why? فَمَا أَرْضَانَا مَا كَانَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ لَا أَحْتَسِبَنَّ وَلَا أَصْبِرَنَّ إِنْ شَاءَ الله. So whatever he did, he did for Allah. What I will do, I will do for Allah. But I know that I will be rewarded. 
He will be rewarded and I will be rewarded and I will be patient on what I see insha'Allah. So, so Zubair radiallahu ta'ala anhu realizing that his mother had her mind set on this, he comes back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, that you know, she's not listening. So the Prophet sallallahu told Zubair, Khalli sabilaha. Leave her alone. Let her come. She came, she saw the body of her brother Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Nadharat ilayhi. She saw him. And she said, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. And she made dua for istighfar, and made dua for her brother. Then she called Zubair radiallahu ta'ala anhu. She had two pieces of cloth with her. She said, Hadani thawbani jitu bihimali akhi Hamza. Here are two sheets of cloth that I have brought from my brother Hamza, hearing what they've done to him. فَكَفِّنُوهُ فِيهِمَا So use this as his shroud. So Zubair radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, جِئْنَا بِالثَّوْبَيْنَ we came, I came with these two clothes, these two sheets. لِنُكَفِّنَ فِيهِمَا Hamza To shroud Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu in them. فَإِذَا إِلَى جَنْبِهِ رَجُلٌ مِنَ الْأَنصَارِ قَتِيلٌ but there was a man from the Ansar who had also been killed. وَقَدْ فُعِلَ بِهِ كَمَا فُعِلَ بِحَمْزَ And unfortunately, they had also ripped off his clothing and mutilated his body as well. فَوَجَدْنَا غَضَادَةً وَحَيَاءً We felt that it was not appropriate. We felt it would be wrong. That we shroud Hamza فِي ثَوْبَيْنِ وَالْأَنصَارِيُّ لَا كَفَنَ لَهُ That Hamza has two garments and this Ansari brother of Hamza's a man who Hamza would call his brother would lie there with no shroud at all. So we said, لِحَمْزَةَ تَثَوْبٌ وَلِلْأَنصَارِ ثَوْبٌ Hamza should get one and the brother should get one. فَقَدَّرْنَاهُمَا فَكَانَ أَحَدُمَا أَقْمَنْ مِنَ الْآخَرِ So when we pulled these sheets, kind of opened them up, we saw that one was bigger than the other. And again, again, instinctually you think you just give the larger one to Hamza and give the other one to the Ansari since it's, you know, Kind of like you're helping him out, it's a donation. But they said, no. That's not fair. Hamza wouldn't want that. فَأَقْرَعْنَا بَيْنَهُمَا So we did kind of like a drawing. Who should get the larger sheet? فَكَفَّنَا كُلَّ وَاحِدٍ مِّنْهُمَا فِي الثَّوْبِ الَّذِي طَارَ لَهُ One narration just basically says very generally that we then gave the sheet to whoever the lot came out to. Some of the more extended narrations mentioned that the longer sheet, the larger sheet, came out for the Ansari. So we wrapped him in the larger sheet. The smaller sheet came to the lot of Hamza. When we cover Hamza with it, it wouldn't cover him completely. And again, the Prophet ﷺ, as he had told us previously, we covered up the feet of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala with leaves of trees. With leaves of trees. <coughs> this... It's, it's so remarkable for someone to live their life in such a way that even their death demonstrates equality and justice and fairness. That's so remarkable that even in death these people were able to teach us these lessons. This Hamza radiallahu ta'ala has departed this world and he's still teaching us how to be fair and how to not discriminate and not to, how not to show nepotism. And favoritism. It's remarkable. This is a very powerful lesson from the life and the legacy of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Inshallah, we'll go ahead and pause here for today's session, inshallah. And we will continue with now the performance of the janazah prayers and the burial of the shuhada of Uhud, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the ability to practice everything that we've said and heard. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu a source of guidance and inspiration within our lives. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallahu bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta, nasaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.